Welcome back to the Offside Show, here for another episode. Uh, big thank you to our sponsor, <laughs> uh, Fale Kava. Um, a bottle? Or should we start this again? See, we've been smashing, we've been smashing them all out. There's no more bottles. You know what? Keep this rolling. <laughs> we did have a bottle, but we smashed all of them Yo. a lot quicker than the first box. Thank you, Fale. Yeah. Tox Fale. Um, no doubt. Probably as Junior goes and brings the box back. Um, how have you find that? Also, like the the the... I guess the response to like this product. Yes. Beautiful. A lot I, of people I love it. Heaps of people are asking about it. Fale Kava. You can get it from the dojo in Odahu. Tox, Tox Fale Dojo. You, and I get mine from, um, I forgot the name. Mangere. Yeah. From, from the Mangere Town Center. There's a little Samoan shop there. Oh, damn. I went in the weekend and got some Fusulu. But, um, you know, it's a great gift. So I, I use it as a gift. Um, especially for my sister She loves it She's a doctor She works really hard And she's looking for something That's not alcoholic mm. To wind down And to chill And so now I've got a few other friends Who um, are looking for that same thing And so I suggest um, Fale Kava It's organic It's um, Pacific business But it's not alcoholic And a lot of people Are switching over from alcohol Which is great Easy to find guys At Fale.Kava yes. At Fale.Kava On Facebook and Instagram or just go to Tox Fale's um, social media page. Mm. That guy's got like over 800,000 on TikTok. Easy to find. He's easy to find and he's easy. He, he promotes his, his stuff easier too. So Fale, at Fale.cover is where you'll find it. Um, let's get straight into it, eh? Um, sending our love to the Hewitt family. Uh, rest in peace. Rest in love to Norman Hewitt. Um, proud Māori, all black. Uh, who had a wonderful career. Um, some legendary moments also. Uh, let's run through some of his highlights. Uh, Hawke's Bay. He was part of the Hawke's, Hawke's Bay team that defeated the British Lions in 1993. Yo. So he would have been in his early 20s then. Um, he was the NPC Player of the Year. Uh, he spent five years in the Super 12. Um, he played nine times for the All Blacks mm. and also scored seven tries. That's yeah. a pretty amazing strike rate. Right. Uh, and uh, is immortalized in our minds as that Māori fella that stood up to the English when yes. they did the haka. Right. And I remember this as a kid um, because even back then, like the haka was kind of a novelty, eh? mm. like in, in, the, in the 90s, right? Yeah. And so to see an Englishman overstep the line... Mm. <laughs> Toe the line, so to speak, right is massively disrespectful. And Norm Hewitt, uh, Hewitt stood up um, yeah, for all indigenous people back then, like Maori people in particular, and just went toe to toe. And I remember reading the article slowly where he was just like, "I wanted to cut his head off. Like if I yeah. had a if I had a weapon in my hand, like I, I it triggered the, the yeah. spiritual side of me." What's right your thoughts on um the bro? Nah, yeah, he, he's a legend, and like you said, it was um. He was also showing like non Maori how you do the haka. Mm. You know what I mean? Like it, it means everything. It's uh, you know you stand your ground. You don't back down. You amp up and um, and ever since then, you know now you see the All Blacks, yeah. man. They bar up when it's haka. Like they give it everything. And so um, yeah, I think he really brought the mana back, and he showed everybody what it's how it's meant to be. Yeah, and I think it's unfortunate. You know, he he came out at a time where there was a dude named Sean Fitzpatrick, mm. and if it wasn't for that, then he probably would have had it, bro. He would have had fifty plus. Yeah, he yeah. would have had a lot of tests, um, because he's sort of like the modern player, like you know, really good, strong uh, ball runner. But yeah, yeah, well, nine tries. tries. Yeah, Shots. hard up. Um, have you ever met him? No, no. Uh, okay. Well, rest in peace to uh, Norm Hewitt, um, a warrior, but also. The, and a very important figure uh, in the culture here. Um, back on sport, we just had State of Origin <laughs> oh. on Wednesday night. I watched it at a bar uh, with my cousins who are all New South Wales supporters, and I got the roasting. God, Lord, Where did you watch it also? <laughs> at home. What's at your home. thoughts on the game? Awesome game, man. Yeah. What an amazing game. The intensity, um, the skill, and just really good to see again, you know, the Samoan, the Pacific players, Shine through and mm -hmm. Luai, gosh, bro, bro, <laughs> just amazing. I don't know how we got man of the match. I can understand all the other players did play well, but he should have got man of the match, maybe man of the series. His plays, you know, the um, the two dropouts, you know, that that uh, you know, that stops Queensland from getting extra sets. His kicks into the end goal where they got repeat sets, 
all of that leads to the 60th, 70th minute where Queenslander gassed. You know, he, he just brilliant. And then his moment of brilliance where he um, had a uh, one-on-one mismatch, had a mismatch on the forward, and he breaks the game open. He's just it, it's that thing you talked about, that yeah. instinct that he has. Yes, yeah. that uncoached, uncoachable shit. Like you, you can't. You can't coach it. He's just so – he's different. He's just different. You know, and, and when both teams are solid, their defense is solid, their attack, they're, they're neutralizing each other, you need someone who's just different. He just does stuff different, sees everything different. Queensland have that player. I think it's um, – Fido, it's um, – Hamasio, I think he's that player, but he got sucked into hitting the ball up too many times. Yeah. And you don't want him for that. Because he's a game breaker, you don't want him charging in, um, setting up plays, because he was getting bashed every play. And the intensity of that game was yeah. unreal. Every tackle was a hit. And um, and I think when he did get an opportunity, like in the 70th minute, man, <laughs> he, he was done. Yeah. It was just uh, it was really good because Cleary wasn't there. You know, there's a lot of talk that Cleary carries Luai. I was Bro, going to bring this up. Luai clearly has never been carried because he has been running Penrith. They're up there. Now he led this team. He led the, the team. Mm. He's just a, a brilliant, magnificent, intelligent player. And he doesn't give a fuck about what anybody thinks about him. The, um, yeah, we'll, we'll get about. We'll talk about the trolling because uh, mm. he's done a bit of that, and I love it. Like I'm, I'm a Queensland fan, but mm. it's the Oaks, man. Samoan fan first, right? Yeah, of yeah. course. And so, um, yeah, uh, that whole game was 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 incredible. And what was what was different was I watched this at a bar where you can't hear the commentary, mm. so you can't hear the biases. Yes, which is like if if you watch like a lot of boxing or even even rugby itself, you'll hear the biases in commentary. Like when you can watch a game and take that that element out and just watch it for what it was right. it's so different eh? like right. and and i could see that intensity like everyone was on the edge of their seats like every that opening 15 minutes was just yeah. all out hits and then it was like that like they were saying it dragged on for like 50 60 right. minutes of hits yeah but it got to a point where rugby rugby league players hate kicking penalties mm. they were just like we have to kick penalties from the sideline from the like side even line. even rugby teams don't do that now yeah. if it's a sideline penalty they kick for touch take the line out no one takes it but they were so desperate for any point and i love that call i think stephen Crowder might have made that call yeah and and that's another player who shined you know uh who, who's their captain he's hardly on the field uh Trevojevic. so you you don't you can't captain from the sideline mm. you know and just a leadership from those Samoan boys man and his deft touches like his kicks into the end goal that force yeah. repeat sets you know in the you, at that moment, it's a forcing a repeat set or stopping a repeat set of the opposition, but it all adds up. And then you get to the 60th minute where Queensland are gassed, and it's yeah. from those intelligent plays, those kickoffs, bro. They're just, um, it's really good to see that these Samoan boys are, bro. And you know what's freaky? They're still 23, 24, 25. Yeah. Like yes. these are still in there, like they've won everything, literally. Mm. <laughs> literally, yeah. And to still be inspired to keep going. And like you said about trolling, yeah. you know, there's a thing in like basketball where some people only talk when they're up, you know. So when, when you're leading, that's when you start going, and what, and what. Yeah. But there's a clip of Luai, like they're losing the game by like 30 points. And he he's is still talk talking. He's that. talking shit to the crowd, yeah. like, fuck you. So those, about that life. those are the real ballers, man, who are, they talk when they're losing and they get the win. You know what I mean? Yeah. So. It's, he's he's uh, he's one of these generational talents, but I think the next story is who, who's he playing for? Well, is he going to uh, Samoa? Oh yeah, 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 I mean, yeah. Samoa, Australia. Because well, the big three in there, correct, or even the big four now, Spencer Lenu, oh, but yeah. all of them are uh, they can very easily just march into that Australian team. Easy, easy, yeah. and I think they're going to be given incentives. You know what I mean? So I think they might have an extra. Zero, some extra zeros on them, especially because, you know, bro, <laughs> they're clearly the standouts. Yeah. But what, um, what would you think if if that was the place? If that if if that happened? If that happened, because of what they've already done for Samoa, I wouldn't mind. Yeah. I wouldn't mind that. You know, they already lost that money. Mm. You know, they they what, what is it? Fifty thousand or forty thousand to play one game? Yeah. For one Russian. one test for. Oh, for Australia. Yeah, for Australia. 
you know, they already gave that up, you know, and they already did something extraordinary for Samoa. And if they want to go and, you know, get some of that cash back and play for Australia, I got no problem with it. Mm. I got no problem with it. On the topic of um on of trolling, uh, did you see the image of Jerome Luai uh, when he posted up on Caxton Street? No. Nah. So, so what's Caxton Street? Oh, so, I saw. Is that the one where he's like standing? Like, yeah, oh. yeah. So Caxton Street is hilarious because the the context is it's pretty much it's all visual. Um, Caxton Street is the street you walk before you get to Suncorp Stadium. That street is the K Road, so it's like pubs, oh, yes. clubs, bars, everything. So even on like a, a Queensland Reds game, like it's packed. Uh, it is oh, packed. it was empty. It was empty. <laughs> he there shut was it no down. one there, bro. Shut it down. <laughs> and he trolled, and 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 I like you know I was. I, I was copying all the hate in my DMs, but at the same time, I was like, you know what? The someone's won this. Yeah, bro. <laughs> like, yeah, you got to be happy. You got to be happy. Um, well, that's it for another year for State of Origin. Uh, I'm excited for next year. And, and this is good. There was that period of time in Origin where Queensland was like eight up, eight years in a row. Mm. And I can honestly say it was like, eh, be nice if they won. <laughs> And perhaps if that red card wasn't given in game one, bro, this could have been a sweet, This man. could have been a sweet, yeah. Yeah, um, yeah well, that's it for Origin uh, this year. Congrats, New South Wales, and all the assholes that jumped in my DMs. <laughs> um, moving back to NZ, uh, and speaking of Adi Savia, uh, an article just came out today. Mm. And so if you'll, you'll be hearing this on Sunday, and it's Friday where this article just popped out, that he is apparently moving to Auckland. And... Uh, the takers, the hot takers, uh, he'll be playing for Moana Pacifica next year. Um, what is your thoughts when you heard this, bro? Well, I think the article is going on like he wants to serve his community in some way. Mm. You know, he wants to give back to uh, Pacific or Samoan people in a way. And I think, like, it's funny we started off with Tor Samoa because I think that might be, you know, have that effect. You know of what I mean? Course. Like, I think a lot of these rugby players who are at the top and been at the top for a while, what else is there? You know what I mean? I've got the money, got the houses, got the properties, got the fame. He's got the cups. Yeah, I've got everything. I've got, yeah, I've, I'm successful. What else is there? And I think um, seeing what Tonga did, seeing what um, Tor Samoa did, you know, maybe there is that, um, you know, want to do something exceptional, something out of rugby that trans, uh, sorry, that uh, changes yeah. and transforms um, lives outside of rugby because at the end of the day like um, what is sport like you know sport is like distraction I used to tweet like before games alright off to distract the masses from re um, revolutionary behaviour because that's pretty much what it was right like, well that's what media entertainment is right really. that's what entertainment it's escapism. is escapism yeah yeah and to sort of like get people to sit, sit on their butts and do nothing pretty much and I think we're getting a generation of athletes who are like okay yeah but maybe I can move our people in some other way, mm. you know, and inspire them to be some, you know, just have some sort of long lasting inspirational legacy. And a lot of that, there's a really big opportunity in Pacific sport is to represent your Pacific country, yeah. you know, especially when you're already one of the best players in the world, you know, how about I uplift my people and what if I make them the best in the world? Imagine that. They've got the they've got the money they've got the accolades, what you know surely there's more to life, or more to rugby, and one of the great challenges would be, you know, yeah. leading a, a maybe a, a low team or like Moana Pacifica what came last this year. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, maybe looking for the next challenge in life, and because um, he said he also wanted to go back to the village and do some clinics. Yeah. You know, so I think he's looking for something more than rugby. You know, he is more than an athlete. He's always retweeted things about the eligibility rule. Mm. He's always... He's a fan of you, Sully. Oh. He's liked a lot of our <laughs> posts on our Insta. Yeah, bro. He's always wanted to represent Samoa. You know, he's always, you could tell, he's always had that in his heart and he's always supported the rule change. Mm. So rugby has the same rules as league that allows Pacific players to go back and play for their country and back and forth. What, what is the problem? Like, I just, I, I look at it from like a financial point of view and like, wouldn't you want 
the 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 coolest crowds in the southern hemisphere, yeah. which are Samoans, Tongans, Fijians, Maoris. Like, wouldn't you want them to be happy? Absolutely. Because we bring in the revenue, we Absolutely. show that in rugby league. Yeah, from exactly. You see, rugby league has gone to a whole nother level, mm. like globally, and now they're realizing the um, the monetary effect of of rugby league now is even more because the markets increase. From a capitalistic point of view, if you want to make money, mm. you would change the rule because Samoa would be awesome you know because you could get all black players at their peak yeah they wouldn't have to wait three years or two years and then play they could switch over tomorrow mm. you know Adi and all the Samoan all blacks all the Tongan all blacks could switch over tomorrow and then obviously we saw what happened with um with the Tongan with the Tongan rugby league MMT, team you, yep. you see the stadium sold oh, out man. flags everywhere so from a capitalistic point of view where money is everything you would change the rule so clearly, this isn't about money. Yeah. This is about making control. sure that these teams are not that fucking good or are not too good so we can be up the top. So that, that is all yeah. it's about unless someone else – because they make this, this um, argument, oh, but it, it'll be an embarrassment to international rugby if, like, Adi Severe switches over to Samoa tomorrow, right? It's an embarrassment because he changes. No, it's not. Mm. He's Samoan. He has Samoan parents who came from Samoa, born in Samoa. He's Samoan. That's not a... What, what looks stupid is you got fucking... What's his name? Bundy Aki playing for Ireland. And that captain, looks stupid. As a captain. Yeah. But I mean, <laughs> good on him. Yeah, that's but amazing. come he's on, he's man. not Irish. Yeah, he's the man. Yeah. But... So they, they can't see that that looks weird. Mm. But it looks weird for Adi Savia and even some players born in Samoa to change over to Samoa. <laughs> and that looks weird. That doesn't look weird. Uh, but he bunny arky like wait. <laughs> every international team has a has a Fijian winger, mate. Just Bro, and <laughs> yeah, and that's okay. Bro, but as soon as a Fiji wants to play for Fiji, like if Issa Nathewa wanted to play for Fiji. Yeah. But he couldn't. Or cause... even play for the All Blacks. I think he might be born in New Zealand anyway. Yeah. But what I'm saying is like it already looks stupid when you can't even play for your for your country. Yeah. Even your country of birth, you can't even do that. And that I, looks stupid. I have a little intel. Um, <laughs> I'll just say it. Um, so prior to, so Las Vegas is a thing now, right? NRL. Yep. Prior to that, it was supposed to be Samoa versus Tonga. Hey. So. Yeah. And they changed it to what? Brisbane and. Oh, it just became an NRL comp. Oh, yeah, But yeah. the Americans wanted the Polynesians. Oh, yeah. They didn't want the NRL. So. Yeah, because there you go. Polynesians have a, a massive reputation in America. Of course, man, they 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 go viral for for good stuff. Yeah, they they're the big friendly strong dudes. <laughs> yeah, but um, yeah, well, that's that's interesting and no surprises there. Yeah, it's just um, yeah, well, um, have you ever thought about Adi possibly looking at the Warriors? Maybe I know that's a lot of things. Uh, like I reckon I he's I weighing it all up. I wouldn't be surprised. This generation, you know. You know, Sonny Bill and them did boxing on the side. You know yep. what I mean? Like, my generation sort of like, I'm a rugby player, I stick to rugby. We never even considered a whole different sport, you know? Um, I wouldn't be surprised if he's looking at league. Mm. Especially, like, league got big money, man. Yeah. They got massive money. So, um, I would suggest don't. Because <laughs> that's brutal, man. <laughs> like, I, I couldn't see what position he would play, but... I'll put him um, at 13. 13? Because he, he's, he's got that seven. He's got gas. Like, he yeah. can run for ages. And he can he's an offloader. Mm. Good ball-playing ability as well. Yeah. Yeah. I'll put him at 13. Oh, yeah. I, I, I'm sure he's considering everything. But um, it's, it's a good move. It's a good move for him. Good challenge. And, you know, greatness is defined uh, um, with the adversities you overcome. And yeah. maybe he's looking for a challenge looking for the new challenge and playing for Moana Pacifica would be a hell of a challenge. Oh, yeah. That would be a hell of a challenge. But not too far away, you know? I mean, like, yeah, it's in the same comp, so. Yeah, well, um, he's back in the All Blacks now um, and we'll see how he plays out the rest of the year. Uh, back on to Samoan sports. Uh, we've got the Olympics coming up just mm. under a week, uh, which is exciting times for a lot of the athletes around the planet competing, um, but also for a lot of our Pacifica athletes and uh, our Samoans, our Samoans that are competing. Um, what have you found um, about our Olympians, bro? 
Yo, so yeah, I was going through that article you sent. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, no, no, no. It's um, I think there's a there's twelve. There is, yep. Yeah, there's twelve and the sevens team that are going over. I think middle chances are what the weightlifters. So, yeah, the weightlifters. So they had the world championship last year, and Opelonge, he missed his last lift of two hundred and twenty, but that would have given him silver mm-hmm. in the world champs. So he's right up there. Yeah. Um, and the other one is um, Sipaya Yungi. So she is ranked fifth or sixth in the world. Yeah. And she missed out on the bronze in the world championship by one kilogram. So, like, this is yeah. the world championship. So they're right up there. And you never know on your day, on the day. Mm. Oh, you know, it's right there. I was reading about um, Alexander Rose, the, um, the shot putter. Or is it, no, the... Um, Discus, his PB is 70, right? And in the last Olympics, the gold was 68. So, I mean, he's he's right there as well. Look, like, the current world record was done this year, I think, 74 meters. Yeah. But, like, you just never know. Like, on your day, sometimes you're about to do your throw and suddenly a gust of wind, yeah. you know, comes behind. You just never know. So, train your ass off and give yourself the best opportunity, you know, so you just never know what happens, man. I wish them all the best, but um, I think there's Atu as well. Atu, yeah, I'm a big yeah. fan of Atu. Yeah. Um, he's a, a really good boxer, a mm. high, high level boxer. That's he's I don't realize he's so young. It's like he's been around for ages. He, it feels like he's been around yeah. for ages, but I think he's just been competing since he was like 13, 14. Mm. Um, so he, yeah, I was living in Australia and, and he became a name and I think he had a toss up between either representing Australia or Samoa. Mm. He could have very easily walked into the Australian team, but he's like, I want to represent Samoa. Yeah. And I love that. I love yeah, that when, yeah. when kids have that op- option, yes. um, but then they take the one that I guess favors their family. Mm. Um, so very honorable. There's um, a lot of grinding to do then because you, because he, hey, ra- ra- raising your own yeah, money. Yeah, 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 yeah he yeah, has raised your own money because, you know, if you play for Australia, everything's paid for. Yeah. Everything's paid for. Yeah, good luck to the team. Um, what are your thoughts on like the sevens team? Again, you never know. You know they've they've got good players. They have, I think, they have made a final this year. Mm. Uh, they have won a tournament a couple of years back. You just never know, man. The the, only, the best you can do is train your ass off, give yourself the best chance, and then just fucking. Just go balls out and see what happens. Have they kept um, Brian Lima? Yes, he's yeah. still there. Oh, cool, me. Um, you know, this year they were relegated, so they're out of the World Series and the second tier now. So if you go by form, you know, but you never know. You it's, never know. At it's, the a, end it's, of the games, a, it's a yeah. one shot. It's a it's a one go at it. I just think it would be so cool for Lima to walk away for a uh, medal Bro, or some sort. Imagine that. <laughs> imagine that. And, and I hope they've trained like that. Mm. And it's really interesting because the Fijian Sevens team who have won the gold medal the last two Olympics, they brought in a lot of Fiji and in, in, in draw guys. Yeah. You know, so like I said before, bro, I would have loved to see Theodore in there, you know, um, Nigel La Wong, some of the wingers from the Manu in there, but yeah. they've stuck with local specialist Sevens players. So um, it'll be interesting. It'll be interesting. But, you know, they're definitely not favorites. They're nowhere yeah. near favorites. But sevens is such a unique thing where, like, um, what is it? Momentum is such a thing, like in a tournament. Yes, momentum is a thing in the tournament as yep. well. Like, um, you might have the shittiest tournament a couple of weeks, uh, a couple of weeks ago, but then but that one tournament, yeah, it just clicks. And you yeah. know, like, there's that uh, rugby saying that like, life is like a rugby ball. You never know which way it's gonna bounce. bounce. And that's how every rugby game you gotta approach. You mm. never know, man. Give it everything and. It might just bounce your way, mm. you know? So, and it does, it always does. It's so unpredictable. And that's what we love about sport, right? Is the unpredictability and, you know, they're full growing men against other men. So, you know, people against people. So, yeah. shit, it's not like you're against a- And they're someone, man. They're going to smash them. Bro, <laughs> they're going to give it their best. Just go hard, man. Smash Fuck them. all the media hype. Fuck who won this year and that year or whatever. Bro. Who was our flag bearer? <laughs> Good question. It'd probably be Opelonghi, maybe, because he's he's done really well over the last few years. Yeah, I think he had a gold in Birmingham, right? The Commonwealth Games. He's maybe. won gold. He's won gold yeah. at, at several times. There, there's some other dudes. I was reading about the uh, Clifton siblings. Do you know him? 
No. Tuva, tu apparently he's a um, he's a host of BFM. Is BFM still going? Wait, what? Yeah, yeah. So he's a host on BFM. Some like clearly that. Central Auckland then. <laughs> <laughs> and um, his sister was in the uh, Black Fins, so it's a New Zealand like uh, sailing team. And she's um mm. she's also in the Samoan team now. So interesting. Yeah, bro. And then, you know, the Olympics has sort of like quota systems, so they let, you know. Some of the smaller countries might not um, make the Olympic qualifying mark, but you're close enough, and they always hold a space for... Oh, right. Yeah, so there will be some um, competitors who will be going there. There's some sailors. Um, yep. Yeah. The sailors are... Let me go back to it. Aroni uh, Leilua. Yes. And um, Astrid Ripley. Yes, that's right. Very yeah. good. And you just never know, man. You never know. I'm I'm glad they get the experience as well. Mm. You know. That uh that Olympic uh, retreat. No, 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 no. <laughs> that that um what is it? The the McDonald's that lives forever. Yo. Um there was some controversy in Tahiti as well, just off the back of, of it, it being placed in, in France. There's French territories involved. Mm. Um yeah. yeah, what were your thoughts on, on this? In, in uh, Te Ahu Po'o. Mm. Hey. So, like you were saying, the Paris Olympics in Paris, in France, but the surfing is 10,000 kilometers away in uh, Tahiti. Yeah, because if you don't know, um, France owns most of the... It's a country that owns the most of the Pacific Ocean, like, and it's not even in the Pacific Ocean. It has the most economic exclusion zones in the Pacific mm. because of the colonies, the French colonies. It owns more of the Pacific Ocean than all the Pacific Islands combined. And so part of uh, the French territories is Tahiti. And so they're going to have the surfing in Tahiti, in the Pacific, in a place called Te Ahupo'o. Mm which um, only got a road there in the 1970s. It, was, it used to be a secret spot for surfing. Yeah. And so they had to build a, a structure where the, the judges will judge the surfing, but it's in the water. Did you see? Yeah. Yeah, did you see it? Because the one that's there before was a wooden one, and they said it didn't pass any health and safety. But there was big issues because in order to build the aluminium one, they had to smash a channel through the reef through the coral reef eh? yeah and then build it and obviously you know in that area they still fish in that area for their food like that's their food like literally they rely on that food and you know there's all sorts of uh, diseases that come from the toxins from the algae that grows off yep. yeah destroyed coral reef and they also talk about how it's the reef that shapes the waves so you destroy the reef you might destroy the waves, mm. you know, and, um, Duh. right. I know <laughs> guys, so, come on. And man. they had these environmentalists and all of these dudes over there saying, it's okay. It's okay. And, uh, the structure has been certified for 10 years, but you look at places like Greece now in the 2008 Olympics, I think like all of their facilities and that lay rotten, yeah. you know, they're just, they're overgrown weeds all over it. No one uses that shit anymore. It's happening in Brazil too? Yeah, they, they put billions of dollars into this shit, promised uh, the uh, people employment and all of that stuff, and all of the structures are just gone to shit. Yeah. Just for a look, like a yeah. look for a For two weeks. Of, for two, yeah. Yeah. And so, again, they've, they've done it here again, obviously, and the long-term effects, well, we'll only find out... Uh, Find out obviously in the long term, but mm. by then, Olympic Committee won't give a fuck. No, they've and, moved on. Yes, as you can see from all of the last Olympics, they've moved on and they don't give a fuck about all of these structures still there, all concreted that no one can use that land. It's just there yeah. rotting. So, you know, there are, there are all these fears. And, um, oh well. <sighs> but um, surfing in Tahiti as well, it's kind of one of those. Is that irony where... I was going to say. Yeah, the first Olympic surfing event is held in a place where surfing was banned. You know, like <laughs> surfing was banned in Tahiti as it was in Hawaii and all of the Pacific. In Tahiti, surfing was banned. Dancing was banned. They weren't allowed to sail to Bora Bora and the Leeward Islands that are all next door. Ra'iatea Taha. That was banned. Uh, Tahitian flowers were banned. Like, 
and surfing. Surfing was banned and now they come back around 200 years later and have <laughs> surfing. It's always give and take, eh? In the place where they ban surfing. Ugh. Fuck, man. <laughs> And you know these uh, Olympic events, let's be honest, it's like a celebration of fucking wealth. You know, it's all the rich countries do well and you know, all these small countries, will they medal? I don't think any, I don't think there's been a Pacific medal other than Ele, Ele Opelonghi yeah. got a silver medal after the drugs cheat. Cheats got um, disqualified. Uh, the Fijian teams, the ru rugby teams. Yep. And then I think there's been some Samoans who have represented America. Or in some the Hawaiians, Soma, yes. Soma, um, uh, let me bring up his name. Oh, the diver. There's there's uh, Greg Luganus. Greg Luganus. Yes. There you go. Sorry. But diver. also way back, there's a dude named Duke Kahanamoku. Bro, you got to look into this dude. He um, won gold medal in 1912. They had World War One, so 1916 Olympics was cancelled. Mm. Won gold again in 1920, and um, he's a oh, amazing story. Amazing story. He um, walked. Walked into a uh, swim meet in Hawaii, broke the world record by five seconds. They blamed it on the watches. They said, oh, there must be something wrong with the watches here. So they took him to the Olympic trial, broke the world record again. They're like, what the fuck? Five seconds in a hundred yard swim. Remember today when, when they do this race, they finish like, you know, it's like nick point, nick. Yeah, point five or second. You, you might break the world record. He broke the world record by five seconds in his first swim. Shucks, and you're small too for a swimmer. You're six foot one. They're typically like six four, six five, right? Yeah, just unbelievable, man. And like, and this is the crazy thing about him is that he actually, his swimming stroke is a stroke that we do now. Oh, okay, true. It's a freestyle with the um, flutter kick. So he's the originator of, the, of yeah. the freestyle. Yes, and so what happened is what they said by 1924 when he got silver, the rest of the world had copied his stroke. Okay, That's so crazy. Remember, 1912, 1920, 1924. So by then, he was the fastest swimmer in the world for 10 years, bro. Unbelievable, man. And so he was also in like 20 Hollywood films. There's also a statue of him in um, Sydney, New South Wales, Freshwater. Yeah. It's a statue because he was the first person who brought uh, surfing to Australia. And you look at the Bogans and, you know, how big surfing is. He went down there on a swim meet, I think 2012 or 2013, a swim meet. Driving along, they saw the waves. He got out of the car. Wait, 2012? Is it? Oh, sorry, uh, 1912. So yeah. Yeah, sorry, <laughs> sorry, sorry, 1912. So um, saw the waves, made his own surfboard from Sugar Pine, went out there and surfed, and people couldn't believe what he was mm. doing. First time they'd seen surfing in shark-infested waters. He taught them how to make surfboards. He taught them how to surf. He taught them everything about surfing. And in Australia, they erected a statue of him. Yeah. And that's how special he is that no one fucking knows about. That surfing was brought to Australia by a dark-skinned Hawaiian. And it's an amazing story. A gold medalist, an Olympian. Um, he also apparently was part of bringing it to Southern California. There's a statue of his surfboard in Christchurch for when he came and visited in, I think it could have been 1914. So I didn't know this. Yeah. But that's so Christchurch, right? We talked about Christchurch <laughs> last week having the in, you know, yeah. in stream, you know, the N word, in stream, in head, right? So instead of a statue of him, they have a statue of his surfboard. <laughs> Bruh, they Bruh. couldn't even let that. Yeah. <laughs> they didn't want to put a dark skin statue. It's bronze anyway, you guys. Jeez, what does the color matter? Yeah. Far out. But like there's so many unbelievable achievements by Pacific people that just go unrecognized. Like this dude. But there's controversy because obviously a lot of indigenous people connect him because he brought a lot of movie stars yeah. and tourism started getting big. And he was one of the dudes who sort of like welcomed them, mm. you know, and you know what tourism has done to Hawaii. It's led to a lot of landlessness. I can see that. Yeah. It kind of opened that door to, and even that thing when you're talking about Tahiti, like the secret spots, it's such a, exactly. it's such a thing in, in, in the islands where this is our family land. Yes. Don't come here. You're right. And the ocean is, you know, it was a deity. It was something... Mm. It was something so special because it provided all sorts and it was a secret spot and those waves are unbelievable yeah. because it's been a secret spot since the start. 
Yeah. And so now it's, you know, it's for the world. We can smash through these ancient coral reefs that no one smashed through yeah. ever, you know, and we can put this aluminium, you know, now we're, we're, we're getting studies where you don't cook in foil because that metal leaks into the food. Mm -hmm. Now we've got an aluminium structure, you know, in the coral reef and we don't know what kind of effects that's going to have. You've like, just put me off um, well, bro. Yes, yes. Thanks. No. So there is a big movement by people in Samoa trying to encourage everybody to stop putting it in foil. Yeah. Use the leaves. Yeah. Use the leaves. And so, yeah, like you're talking about these magic, uh, sorry, these um, secret spots and yep. this, this ancient information, ancient knowledge. And that's why these places have been beautiful yeah. forever because we've always respected the environment now we're gonna see. Now yeah. we're gonna see something else. So maybe Duke was just maybe a bit naive in that regard, where he just he had all the success and he probably wanted to bring the world together. I, I don't know the story, but it's just it's, it's sad that that's the case. And one thing about his journey was he had to. Um, there were places where he would go. He would go to restaurants and he wasn't allowed in because he was dark skinned Yeah, you know. Was he, this in America? Yeah, this was in America. Right. So when he made the American swim team, yeah. So. Was um, a surfboard allowed in? <laughs> you know, he um, there was a, a a boat that capsized, and it was described as the greatest rescue by a human being in the world. And he went out with his surfboard and just saved one dude after the other. And there were some people who died. And from that point, every life uh, surf life saving or lifeguard area had to have surfboards because of what he did. Bro, he's this bro. This dude is unbelievable. Check him out, Duke Hanamoku. And Duke Hanamoku. Just and so he, it's described like the amount of racism that he had to go through just to be on the American swim team. You know, at that time, remember, black people were being lynched, and it was like yeah. okay. They had their lynch mobs. You know, you drive through the South and you see black people hanging from trees. So the tr he was treated that way as well. Like he had threats. Wasn't allowed in restaurants, wasn't allowed in some hotels to stay. So in spite of all that, he still went out there, represented uh, America. And even in that time, there were other Hawaiians getting gold medal in like backstroke in the relay team. So at that time, Pacific swimming was, was beyond anything else in the world. And they asked him about what he thought his ancestors swam like and he's like our ancestors had a style far greater than what any of us <laughs> would ever have of course because they had nothing else but the swimming and the and their boats right and they were swimming from island to island like it was but you know the olympics has a um has been influenced by pacific people and you know surfing all the freestyle swim strokes you know so i don't know <sighs> see your involvement there it's one of those things, eh? Like the, the, the games, like it's it's absolutely amazing for the athletes to compete in. But then the the, the catch twenty two side is there's not a lot of money in it directly for a lot of the athletes, mm -hmm. and then there's kind of like that big advertising thing where they just lump this money here onto a bit of land, mm -hmm. and then they disappear for the next four years. And you're right, like um, and there's a lot of writing about how the Olympics exploit and try validate itself by the inclusion of small countries when they know they're never going to win a medal. Mm. You know, remember Eric the Eel? There was a, they put a, 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 a dude to swim, right? It was really bad. And he barely finished the lap, you know, but it's like, we are the world. Everyone's involved here. <laughs> but then you see the medal table every year and it's the same colonial countries at the top. You know, it's like... Gosh, <laughs> and you know there was that dude who did like a middle table of like medals per per um, acre of land stolen. Have you seen that middle table? You know, at the end of the day, this is just a <laughs> massive, massive cash cow. I think they are trying to pay. I think the the athletics. I think you do win prize money now. This is the first Olympics. Oh, true. And that's crazy because they've been earning billions, trillions at every Olympics and not paying a single cent. Tax write off to, to the people who are fucking doing all the work, all the uh, athletes, uh, yeah. the people we came to see. Yeah, hard out, get <laughs> absolutely nothing. All right, well, we're going to keep tabs on the Olympics um, as our podcast goes through, and we'll be supporting all our Samoans and all the um, fellow Pacific competitors uh, going forward. Um, we will be, 
we are recording this on Friday, so we will be missing the All Blacks Fiji result. However, uh, we we thought about um, why the All Blacks, in this regard, don't just play in the Pacific. Like it's all cool that All Blacks and Fiji are playing in America. I think that's great for the Fijian team as well. Great experience for them. Uh, but for the longest time, we've always wanted the All Blacks to go and play in Tonga. In Samoa, in Fiji. I, I, I believe they might have played in Fiji in the past. I'm not too sure, but I know definitely they haven't played in Fiji, uh, in Samoa or Tonga. Um, but they did in 2015. Um, so I guess before we get to that, um, in a very broad manner, the All Blacks, why they will never play in, in the Pacific, bro, or well, up until 2015. It's a money thing. Mm. Well, that's what they always said. And it's a money thing. But there were many reasons why they should. So th I think we explained this before. The old way of doing business in, in rugby is that the host country, so Samoa, will pay for all the flights and accommodation of the touring country, but Samoa will keep the revenue from the gate. Mm. So England... When they want to play Manu Samoa, they fly Manu Samoa over, pay for the flights and the accommodation, but England keeps all the gate. Now, when Samoa keeps the gate, and what I mean by gate is that uh, the stadium ticket sales. I remember when tickets were like two tala, <laughs> you know? And so the ticket sales is not much. Yep. And it's nowhere near paying off the flights and the accommodation that you had paid for for the opposition team. You know, with the squads being so big. In England, though, one seat is 70 pounds. Yeah. Okay? Which is about 350 tala. Well, it was, like, times five. So, from... from 60,000 people in the stadium? Yeah. Not, uh, 80. 80,000 took in them. Right? So, their gate is massive. <laughs> and the sponsorship deals and all of that shit. Mm. Our sponsorship in Samoa might be Digicel, mm. maybe the main sponsor, and then you get the smaller ones. So... That's the excuse is that that old business arrangement that um, the countries were doing doesn't work. It doesn't work. So what happens is now the All Blacks go, no, we are not going to took in them unless we get $2 million up front. And they have agreed because they want, you know, they know the All Blacks are a massive pool. And so they have these fixed fees now. Mm. And the All Blacks are awesome at negotiating. Every year they increase it. You know, because their brand, that's why you got to win. You know, your yep. brand. Um, now Australia do it. South Africa asked for that and stuff like that. But that why that's why they say um, it's actually not fair on the Samoan Rugby Union to fork out the money for... Um, that's a loss, man. Right, it's a loss. So there were, uh, I think the arrangement was done where New Zealand got to pay your own shit because the pressure that was put on the New Zealand Rugby Union and what was exposed came out, you know, about in the past, how they went to South Africa during apartheid for diamonds. That all came out. So while black people are being punished, you know, are being treated unfairly in South Africa, you go over, but now to a free Pacific country where no, no Samoans are being treated unfairly, they run the country, you won't come over. Mm. You know what I mean? So that came out. All of the history about how 20 African countries at the Montreal 1976 Olympic Games, they boycotted the games because of what the All Blacks did, specifically for the All Blacks. So when you get John Walker's gold medal in 1976, his main rival, the Tanzania guy, Philbert um, Tayi, or T-A-Y-I, he wasn't Stepped there. Up. Because Tanzania boycotted. Right. Okay, so that's why Montreal 1976 Olympics has a massive asterisk next to it. Yeah. All right. And the sole reason why 20 African nations, bro, if you did that now, you'd be called racist as fuck. Yeah. You know, because the UN had an embargo, they told everyone, don't go play any sports against South Africa because of apartheid. We need to put pressure on them to treat black people fairly. And what does fucking New Zealand do? Man, fuck the black people. We're going yep. for the diamonds. We're going for the diamonds. So the all blacks went. So when the black, when the 20 African countries boycotted the Olympics, it wasn't for, because of New Zealand. It was because of the all blacks. Mm. Okay? Racist pieces of shit. Right? So they boycotted the Olympics. Okay? So um, 
all that came out. The history came out. And it was also said, like, and I think this is what got them riled up more, is that had had Hitler invited the All Blacks to pay for the right pli- price, they would have went. They would have fucking went. And that's what they didn't like. Mm-hmm. Now, I know people are like, John Campbell was all of this. Steve Chu went on Campbell Live and said, no, we're not going until maybe 2023. Shut it down. And so all the real shit came out. And then Coca-Cola um, International got involved, right? And um, they didn't like what was coming out. And then all of a sudden, everything changed. Mm. But there's, there was, there's a very dark history with the All Blacks. Remember, in order for Brian Williams to go and play in South Africa, he had to be called an honorary white, all right? Otherwise, he wasn't allowed to come because of his Samoan heritage. So, and the All Blacks made him. Okay, so he went as an honorary white, okay? So this is the argument that was made. There was, if you can go to that and support racism, you can come to fucking Samoa that's only three hours down there. Yeah. Gosh, do we have to be in chains? Do we have to be treated unfairly for you to come to Samoa? Is that what you want? Because you endorsed apartheid. You said, fuck you to the 20 African countries. I don't give a fuck. And it's crazy. But... um. There are so many reasons why the All Blacks should have went. Even like at that time, Super Rugby, NPC Rugby, Age Group Rugby is predominantly Polynesian, Pacific people. Yeah, Like that's why New Zealand Balangis are awesome. They grow up having to tackle these fucking massive islanders <laughs> at a young age. Yep. So you get Richie McCaw, you get Karen Reed, these dudes who have grown up having to tackle massive islanders and they become awesome at their, sh- at their shit. Like... That's what's made New Zealand. That's been New Zealand's point of difference. Mm. You know, otherwise it'd just be all until these- until this era yeah. where every other country now has yeah. their own set of islands. Yeah, exactly, yeah. exactly. And New Zealand have exclusively had that for ages. Mm-hmm. You know, so there's that. You know, they should have went for that. They should have went to Samoa because of the history between New Zealand and Samoa. Yeah, and that goes back since. Excuse me. That goes back to the. Taki Timu, if you want to take it back to there, where the boats that brought Māori to New Zealand were made in Samoa, okay? And not just the boats were made, the people who made the boats, the people who got on the boats were Samoan. Mm. And I know a lot of people don't like that, but I'm sorry. You know where you're from? <laughs> but you see, even there, and into more recent times, you know, the, the, the uh, dawn raids, yeah. but even before that, the Mao movements, the colonization, where they sent 150, 200 uh, Anzac soldiers. They sent, it even says in the, in, in the Papakura Museum, it was the Anzacs who came over and colonized Samoa. It, it was the New Zealand soldiers who shot the innocent Mao leaders who were marching. Okay? They've been in our history since, man, since the start, since the ancient times, in the modern times. Dawn raids, all of this. Yeah. You know, we've been connected for so long. They, sh- they could have come over for that reason. You had the rugby reason. You had the history reason. And then you had, okay, if you did this to South Africa, you had the apartheid reason. There were so many reasons why they should have come over. And they still didn't. It's a game of rugby, guys. Come play. Shit. <laughs> it's come play. Gosh. It, it was long overdue. And you know what? We partied like it was long overdue, eh? Yeah, yeah was, bro, yeah, that I was, week. I, I was there. That that was. And you know the, the a massive point of difference. Like I was one of those kids that was sent to Samoa when I was uh, when I was young. Um, so a lot of my kind of going over to Samoa has been in somewhat of a negative light. Like mm. I love your love is. I was sent earlier. Yes. This was probably the one time where I got to just be with people yes. and enjoy the island for what it was. Yeah. That whole week in 2015, that, that was so much. That was like, that's a memory I will I will take yes. forever. Um, I was there with Tama. Mm. Um, you didn't make it, eh? Uh, but we had a <laughs> core cool group of us yes. and it was a, a pretty amazing time. And it also kind of speaks to the power of people, mm. our people in particular. Like a game like that to unite the whole country. Like Yo. we drove around the whole island and there wasn't one village that wasn't partying. Right. Everyone was partying. Hard out. It was amazing that week. And we, and we partied like it was like, um, it was family returning. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. So the All Blacks, because of our history, oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. you know, because of, and, and our family returned. Like yeah. 
all the Samoans from overseas came back. The All Blacks finally came, but it wasn't like, oh, finally. Yeah. It was like, you know, because of our history, because of everything we've gone through together, you know. Shout welcome. out to uh, Nufuali who had all yes. the uh, the billboards yes. out on the water <laughs> of the All Blacks players. Yeah, that's right. yeah man. <laughs> Hard out. See, our people are creative, man. No, you know, like Savati, man. Oh, so I was, Savati yeah, was, was going off. Just, you know, the drive from Sali along all the way around the yeah. island. Yeah, you know, all those decorations, man, like another level there. It always paints um, the imagination in my mind when, because I'd, I'd, I've never lived there, lived there. Mm. Um, but whenever, like, like I can only imagine what it was like in 91 when Manu Samo beat Wales. Mm. I can only imagine what it was like every David Tua fight. Yeah. I can only imagine what it was like when Tua Samo won. We got a small piece of that in 2015, yeah. eh? <laughs> no, that was extraordinary because that was the first time they ever been, man. Yeah. And it wasn't like a second string team. Like no. Carter, they were all Sunny there. Sunny Richie McCall. Yeah. They, they, had they the were all team. there. And it wasn't a blowout. Nah. Fuck, Samoa could have won that game, man. Nah. <laughs> it wasn't a blowout. And I couldn't believe, man, you see, cloud seeding. Bro, the, <laughs> the sun didn't come out, bro. The sun uh, didn't come out, bro. And they were in black. Had the sun come out, bro, they would have been dead by halftime, man. They're so lucky. <laughs> they are so lucky, yeah. bro. The sun didn't come out, but it was an amazing occasion, man. We partied like fucking Where were you in the day. St- were you in the stadium? I was in the stadium. Yep. I was on the, you know, the side where they say, oh, it's a cheap seats. Yeah, I was on that side. Oh, we're on the same side then, yeah. I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And just, I saw someone say, oh, I don't want tickets in the cheap seats. You know, like as a player, I used to go buy a whole area in the cheap seats, right? And my family will go sit there. But we used to go out and give tickets to all the kids who were working yeah. on the street. And we just make it a massive party, man. And that's what it felt like that. that How about the that kids day. in the coconut trees that climbed yeah. the way to the top to watch the game? Yeah, bro. <laughs> you got to do what you got to do, man. In any any view. But yeah. you see them throughout the week. You know, kids got to go see the All Blacks. And, yeah. oh, man. And that, yeah, that week was incredible. And, um, man... Because you, you, you lived there at the time, I was living right? there at the time, What yeah. was the economy, uh, the economy like, um, I guess, during and after? It's it must- always big. It's yep. always big on those occasions. Manu Samoa games in Apia, you know, the opposition's coming over. And the All Blacks have a massive touring fan base. Mm. They, they have oh, tours. Heaps, yeah. tours. Yeah, Their fans go, whenever the All Blacks go to France, they have these massive touring groups that are led by former All Blacks who yep. would take like 40 people and they pay for everything. Top top um, hotel, top this, top that, uh, top food, um, drinking every night. So it was the same. Their, their massive uh, support, uh, support, support, their massive support system came as yeah. well. And obviously the economic benefits flow on. The All Blacks wore um, Eveni, Eveni shirts on yep. their arrival. So stuff like that, you know, you get a salmon business. Who, who gets to be promoted by the All Blacks. And, um, man, it, it was a great occasion. It was a, it was a great yeah. occasion. and But you just don't want it to be a one-off. You know nah, what I mean? Nah. <laughs> this, this can be more, man. Like, yeah. especially there's Tonga, there's Fiji. Like, it's a great kind of, like, opportunity for business. Yeah, like, for If you business. want to market it that way. But then also just for us, our people. Mm, um, it was, it's one of the, uh, the events that I remember fondly um, where – like it felt like nothing went bad the whole week. Like there was no controversy. There was no, I don't know. I'm just speaking from my Absolutely. point of view. But I left Samoa going, man, that was an amazing week. No. <laughs> oh, that, and that's how like, uh, I'll, I'll tweet as well. Like they're here now, whatever was said in the past, done. You know, <laughs> yeah, let's, yeah, yeah. let's fucking celebrate and have the yep. best time, man. Yeah. yeah. No, that, that was, that was Come awesome. back all blacks. Come back to the Pacific. <laughs> Come back. Moved on to England. Get have a party. <laughs> Go to the We got diamonds, man. We got diamonds. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. We got diamonds. Um, all right. So uh, that, that completes our uh, sports segment. Um, on to the serious business. Donald Trump, guys. Your thoughts? <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. That photo was legendary. Holy, what a shot. Bro, the, that flag. How the hell how did the, that? Bro. Come on. That's not, that's not Photoshop. Come on. Tin, did you see the guy on TikTok? Hats on. Did you see the guy on TikTok? So the guy that took the photo had a GoPro. Did you see that? He had a GoPro on. So he filmed the whole thing of him taking shots. Mm. And you can kind of see him from other cameras. Oh, that pellet gun, eh? That pellet gun. Yeah. Man. Come on, man. <sighs> Bro, look. USA. USA. <laughs> USA. U.S. <laughs> America's the biggest liars, bro. You know, the fucking Iraq war, 
all of their bullshit. They fucking are perpetually at war. You know, now it's come out. You know, Dr. Martin Luther King died in the hospital after. You see that one? Mm. Fuck, it's in a book and everything. Like, man, I don't believe anything that comes out of America, man. Conspiracy then? Yeah, bro. Absolutely, yeah. bro. Absolutely. I've watched uh, a few podcasts on this, um, and apparently that kid was stationed in there for a good couple of minutes, and he was pointed to um, by people that were in the crowd. Like, they, people in the crowd are like, to the police officers, hey, this guy's right here positioned that way. We don't know if that's a real gun or not. Mm. And they did absolutely nothing about it. He was there for a good 20 minutes. Mm. Um, and I'm like, in the movies I watch, yeah, yeah, in, the movie, yeah. <laughs> in the movies I watch, they, they jump on that guy. Hard out. They jump on that guy straight away. But then also in the other movies, there's conspiracies. So I don't know. Come I don't on, know. Oh, man. It's just, what do you think? <laughs> I don't know, man. Are we in the Matrix? Or? <laughs> <laughs> just... Oh, it's, just, it's so uh, surreal, eh? Yeah, it just feels like it's right on time. Mm. Yeah. Right on time. Um, oh. That's that's the other argument a lot of people are making is that, oh, he's won the election now. Especially with the other dude who's fucking lost. He's Doesn't half he dead. fucking forgotten his own name? Shit. I mean, just keep on keep an eye on like the investment stuff, like the exchanges. Yeah. Because those are telltales of, you know, where the money's moving. Mm. Like that's that's the trail itself. Is all in that, you know, they'll like a lot of those senators and all of them are investing, and they have to declare it. Um, so you can go and check out who's investing, who's sold, and who's bought, and what. Yeah. Um. And you know, like we've seen with uh, Trump's uh, election in the past, you know the. The market took a dip, or there are there are certain dips in the market that have, mm. you know. Kind we don't of want time. you around here, Donald. <laughs> so we'll see what happens, but yeah, usually like money's moving. Yeah. If you look at it that way. What? Why is Biden a thing? I don't understand why you would employ someone who's 175 years old to lead uh, a country. Uh, unless you want him to lose, it's it's been set up. Uh, yeah, I don't know. It's it's a uh, yeah. We we do have some Americans that tune in from the Pacific community. Um, you guys, we don't understand. Jump in the comments and, and tell us. But from the outside, this just looks like a big show. Yeah. You got some thoughts, Junior? <laughs> um. <laughs> it's a game. Mm. Mm. Um. <clears throat> It's almost like a, um, uh, what do you call it? Uh, yeah, it, it, it's almost a game. Mm. Yeah. And it's almost like it's not democracy in a way. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So yeah. only two parties, two people, the people didn't vote for those two. Right. Right. So how does this whole politic process mm. work? Uh, you know, so you got, I mean, okay, the constitution, people for the people, mm. but is it really people for the people? I don't think so. So, yeah, um, yeah I don't really know. I mean, good on, good on Trump. I mean, is he still alive? I mean, I, I know that he got shot, but... Mm. He's fake. It's, that's not a real Trump. Oh, is it's it? Oh, okay, see, there you are. It's the game. Yeah. 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 So. Now, Hara, I, I, I don't like that shit too. Like, that whole binary thing, you know? There's always... They only put two leaders for us to choose from. Yeah. So, fuck. Same thing here. Like, it's always red and blue. Red and blue. Right wing, left wing. I mean, it's it's whoever's in the pocket, right? Like, like who's in their pockets? Yeah. Really. Why can't we have leaders, like, actually fight? Like, can we just... Because someone's <laughs> send send the <laughs> fucking leaders to the wars, bro. Yeah, get Fuck. them to the front line. And I'll follow that person. Mm. If they could knock, <laughs> if they could knock out someone. I'll follow that person, but not Biden and not Trump. Like, yeah, I don't. I don't know. And they always say, "Oh, but they're the leaders of the free world." Man, get fucked. Bro, get fucked. <laughs> China's on the come up. <laughs> <laughs> Russia's around the corner. Yeah, yeah, bro. Fucking hell. Oh, 
Choose your imperialism. <laughs> Fuck. Yeah, hard out. Who do you want to colonize you? <laughs> Choose a person you want to rule over you. Fuck, you know. Uh, well, best of luck <laughs> to America and the and the rest of the free world. Um, an article popped up from the Pacific Media Network uh, that Tama brought to the group chat. Yeah, of and course I it was you, uh, Tama. <laughs> work. <laughs> That's an interesting conversation uh, And it's uh, on pmn.co.nz uh, The title of the article is Does Pacific just mean Samoan in New Zealand? PMN's uh, Awea or Aula? Vaimaila Summer's mate Summer's mate dives into the sentiment That Samoans are overrepresented in Pacific spaces Speaking to Samoan academics And how it's all connected to culture Colonialism and capitalism. Uh, I'll just read the first paragraph. Does Pacific just mean Samoan in New Zealand? This is a question a few Pacific non-Samoan people have raised with me. They'd go to Pacific spaces or workshops in university to find it's mostly run through a Samoan cultural lens. This is particular seen with the use of the term va, a Samoan concept for space, which unintentionally overrides other Pacific concepts. Talk. <laughs> Talking the VAR. Well, how many salmon got PSD? I don't know. <laughs> well, doesn't Tonga have more per capita? Oh, do they? Yep. I they thought do. it was us. No, oh, my they, bad. They, they do now. <laughs> See, that's a very salmon centric lens. Hey. Always picking, <laughs> picking home team. So you're always <laughs> taking up space. <laughs> <laughs> the VAR. The VAR. <laughs> Just taking up the VAR, bro. Um, wait, so you, are you saying. There should be more Tongans in charge? No, no, no. There's, there's a lot of... To there's, I mean, up to 2015, there's a lot more Tongans with PhD, mm. right? But in, in terms of taking over space... Um, Does Pacific just mean Samoan in New Zealand? Like... Well... I think it's... It, it, I mean, who wrote it? A Samoan. Well, there are. It's taking up space in fuck. Someone else should have wrote the fucking article. Yeah, well, they're talking to academics shit. that are non Samoans, and the perspective is that is that it's it's dominant by Samoans. And I'm thinking, well, man, we we are the majority of Pacific people. Look, I don't think anyone's trying to dominate. I think just a lot of people are just trying to make it. They're working their fucking hardest to try and make it, trying mm -hmm. to get some space somewhere. And that's it. It just so happens that the person next to them might be someone as well. Mm. well, well, well how, how, how do you explain shit like Tav then? You know, the fucking number one Pacific label is fucking Cook Island. True. Shit. And this, va yeah, like I knew this fucking article would have diaspora in it. I knew it. <laughs> as soon as I saw the what it's about, I bet you this fucking author is going to use the word diaspora multiple times. <laughs> there it is, diaspora. There it is, diaspora, diaspora. Oh, I was like, fucking uh, hell. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the flag was, you know, when they said they're speaking with, um, you know, n what, what is it? Non, non Samoan academics. You know, that, that word in academics goes hand in hand. Fuck. Mm. And, and, and you know who uses VAR? The fucking Samoan acad academics. It's yeah. those PhDs. They're the only ones who use that fucking term. Here, here's a solution. Stop using that term. There. You, is is that your only problem? Is that uh, you, you talk about the VAR in a, in a Samoan way? Oh, well, I'll stop yeah. talking about the VAR there. Now what? Yeah, I've, I've heard that term from a lot of... PhDs. I hear it from them. Yeah. just I don't want to name their names. You know who you are. Fuck. Well, you've lived in Sa. Do they use the word? <laughs> no, they yeah, don't. None of my family. No one talks word. about no. that. Yeah. It's either get out of the VAR. That's all I get. <laughs> VAR off. <Yeah. laughs> <laughs> oh, shit. It, yeah, I mean, they, they use the VAR a lot because that's the only way that they think it's easy to describe. Yeah, and they think it's deep. Like, well, pfft. I, I, you know, to be honest, like, I do a lot of deep shit. I delve deep into a lot of our Pacific history. I've never needed that. Yeah. You know, I, I, it's, it's so fucking academic. Like, it's only the fucking, ugh, it's just point, pointless. Like, the same people who use the VAR are using diaspora. Mm. Fuck. And those people belong to our diaspora. <laughs> <laughs> diaspora. <cunts. laughs> it's always the academic spaces, eh? 
Bro, honestly. Is it? Well, yes, I haven't heard that. Have you heard that anywhere else? I've heard it from PhD candidates. I've heard it PhD from the, the wankiest hey. Samoans I've ever met. Yes, the ones, the ones that to talk are about. trying to be as Samoan as possible. Yes, and, and delve into complicated yeah. concepts. So the vibes, so bro, bro, let's just you know we can yeah. we can talk about well, something else and relate better. The um, majority of the um, social workers, youth workers. They use that. Um, mm. It's a buzzword, though. They use that word because that part of the um, really quick part of the process when you deal with mental health. Yeah. You know, especially in that in that um, health um, mm. space. So that's why that um, system, which is actually the salmon system, right. where they talk about the folly and the foundation was over, it's been around for almost thirty years. And that become part of the curriculum. Mm. And now that other specific people are using that as a guide, mm. right? And now they're using that to... Yeah, I mean, it's just the framework yeah. for yeah, people yeah, yeah, to yeah. find themselves. Like, as we're talking about different journeys, you know, people mm. paying for Indigenous studies, for example, <laughs> like, you know, 14 to 15K. Use that um, money, go to the island. Well, yeah, yeah. And, that, <laughs> and, and that's exactly what I was, was going to go down, is that, you know, this is for a lack of immersion. Yeah, like being able to live in that environment, like this is kind of like, oh well, here, here's kind of a, uh, you know, maybe a new age take on trying to immerse yourself into, you know, into your culture or using that framework mm. to kind of find yourself, and then eventually you just replace it. Like I, I kind of related to how islanders have latched onto hip hop as a framework sure. of finding themselves. Yeah. Um, so you could say this is a very similar thing for those in New Zealand. Um, you know, especially with academics, like you know, with academics writing about problems from a from a theory point of view. There's a lot of terrible people in this country that have used hip hop. So I'm just. <laughs> oh yeah, and there's a lot of people that. There's a lot that. of eat ass rappers out here that think they can say the n word. And I mean, yeah, I mean, regardless of that, like you know, it's it's been it's been used to fill a void mm. where you know, culturally, yeah, the the cultural void. So yeah, you know, I'm, I mean, whether Samoans take up a lot of space or not. Um, do I want to say it's almost like an imaginary issue in a sense? Like, but but I get it though because I get it. Yeah, you know you you know you go to these things like if you've ever been to any academic stuff, like you go there and you're like, oh yeah, this guy's Simon, so the other person's Simon, and then you think, man, like is that is is that uh, is it just Simon here? Yeah. Like, like where's everyone else? And I've seen it like, and I guess in the the creative space like i've i've produced shows with like so my mate <laughs> I hope he doesn't hear this but my mate regan for example and i've worked with him um but sometimes he has to play the salmon card because they'll give him a head like the other side when you're applying for funding apps they won't get what a new way and took alone looks like mm. and so he says also you know what i mean so sometimes he has to play the game um so i can see it in that regard like there's kind of like the that's what I meant by dominance. Like we, we kind of just, there's more of us mm. in the space. Not to mean that we're trying to dominate people, but just by default, there's more Samoans here in New Zealand. I guess it's would be considered mainstream when it comes to Pacific thought. Like as in you think Pacific, True. and maybe the first thing that comes to mind because of, A, we've been here longer. Yeah. Um, you know, especially with our history anywhere. Um, we're at the forefront when it comes to Pacific. Like, yep. As in, you know, you're commonly thought, oh, yeah, Samoan, Tonga. And the answer will differ depending on where you go, of course, but, mm. you know, we're always at the forefront when it comes to, you know, on the surface level, we're going, oh, yeah, Pacific. I'm, I'm sure they'd be thinking of Samoa. It says currently in the article, currently Auckland's Pacific population is mostly Samoan, one and two, followed by Tongan, one and four, Cook Island, Maori, Two and ten in UN, one and ten across NZ. Samoans make up roughly forty six percent of the total population of Pacific people. It's a lot of space. It's a lot of va. Ah. Mm. I don't see it as an issue. It just it is what it because is. Because you're Samoan, you don't see it. <sighs> I think I think that's fair though. I think that's fair though. I think that's fair. You know, there there comes like I don't know, like funding, for example, right? Yep. They're like, oh, okay, so, you know, they obviously know, like, there's enough history and enough performances from 
from Samoans to warrant, okay, we kind of know what they can do. I, I'm not too sure what a New England could do. Mm. Or I'm not too sure what a Cook Islander could do type of thing. So Nothing you know, you said. Just checking, checking. So <laughs> you put your money on, on you know, like a like a winning horse type thing. Mm. And Why do you have to bring the Tomlins into the <laughs> Not just joking, sorry, I'm getting silly. Sorry. <laughs> no, nah, fun, is- fun is not doing on race though, is it? Yeah. I, yeah. But, but, no, I get what you but, mean. But, but you know, and that's the thing, like when people are looking at odds mm. and you know, the things that have uh yeah. they're encountering that oh I haven't really had much experience. Or it's it's, it's the hands. market. It's the market. Like, how are we gonna make money? We want lots of people to watch this. Okay. 46 percent 50 percent of Samoan we got a bigger chance of making money there yeah yeah so but then I don't know that uh red white and brass was amazing and that was written by Licky who's part you in yeah you know that, I don't that's know. recent though that, that this is remember that's recent tell me mm. something that was written by someone like that say within the 90s or even now Villa, Villa wrote quite a few things yeah and, and and Villa's part you in yeah, but that's yeah. one person out of... That is true, yeah. That's oh, there's one... Shampo Lelisi as well, another one. Um, trying to name all the new ends. I, I think the onus is on you, man. Like, fucking get out there and move. If you want more of your people in those spaces, fucking do something yeah. about it. You know, writing about, oh, uh, I feel like this is like what we used to write about white people. You know, like, <laughs> fucking white people are taking all the spaces. Okay, someone's come along. We're going to fight for our space. Oh, Samoans are taking too much space. Oh, fuck. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, And to kind of add to that, like, I've I've never looked at it this way. Like, yeah, obviously, there's more of us, but it's like, whenever I'm in the room with a fellow mm. UN, Tongan, Tuvaluan, Cook Islander, like, I always see them as equal. That's just like, I'm just speaking from perspective. Like, it, it's never been, but it's, it's weird because I'm Samoan, right? So it's hard mm. to kind of have that, but. Yeah, yeah, because yeah, he makes a claim in there that a Asafo guy, like, he knows of people who want it, like, or Samoan, who are deliberately trying to make it, like, or Samoan. Mm. Like, bro, give us an example, because I fucking... Yeah. I, I don't see that, unless that's probably my bias and privilege. I mean, you know, <laughs> we, we all have blind spots, and, you know, maybe, yep. you know, well, they always talk about unconscious bias, right? Mm. You know, people that you know you tend to maybe hang around that people that may look like you or share the same values as you and if they happen to be all Samoan well then mm. you know it may reflect that you gotta you gotta understand that we are Samoan have it's, it's already embedded in our culture and I, I think of our language mm. right they're all in Makai level you know so and that's why we we tend to be proactive in what we do, you know, whether it's good or bad. Right. You know, who leads it? We, I mean, if no one doesn't do it, what happens? We lead it. And that's why majority of us actually do it. Yeah, hard up. You know, yeah. and if you look at the other culture, like the New Wayne and the Cook Island, they're going to have the different uh, motivation. The tongues and shaman very similar, right? Mm. Their motivation is that, oh, I want to be successful or wish, wish forever. And that's why we have that attitude that we bring it on the table. Mm. The New Orleans and sometimes they look at us like big brothers. That's why they call us big brothers. Mm. And that that's always been the attitude. Uh, so I don't know. I mean, I mean, perhaps that all our challenges are different. So you know, the the Tongans will have different challenges. New Orleans will have different challenges. And the thing is, with academic spaces, sometimes they tend to lump everyone, you know, within the same. You know, or, or or try to, you know, make every, you know, try to describe everyone as having the same issue. Like we share the same challenges because you know, it's almost like oh yeah, because everyone's brown, everyone has the same challenges because they're brown. But no, like we've kind of we were at, we were all at different stages as migrants. Yeah, mm. like you know, certain migrants have been here for certain generations, just like Samoans have been here for X amount of generations. Um, you know, you had Tongan starting to roll through in the nineties. Um, so, you know, different stages uh, warrant different issues. And so uh, then that means that our problems, you know, in relation to the dominant races here or or the frameworks here, we're, we're going to be at different stages and different leverages in, in regards to how we gain from that. So just like funding, it's just like yep. our leverage is a lot different than, than a New Orleans leverage, for example, unless they've done exceptionally well and... 
you know, yeah. they'll they'll be except like they'll be an exception, but yeah. but you know what I mean. It's, <clears> it's just you know, I we're, think we're yeah. seen with different leverages based on how long we've been here and our position in society. And Pacific people is at eight percent of the fucking population here. I can't believe this is a fucking issue, man. You know, like the eight percent now are fucking arguing with each other about our eight percent space. <laughs> are you fucking kidding me? Gosh, like. <laughs> Create some more space then. I Fuck. Mean, how many universities are there? Oh, bro. I, I just think the onus is on everyone. <laughs> Samoans are not trying to dominate space. That's bullshit. Samoans are just trying to fucking be the best person they can be. Trying to excel. Because like you said, like we're fucking raised. You got to be a doctor. got to be a lawyer. You got to do something. You got to be something. Shut up. Do more. Don't fucking talk shit. Get out there and do something. Like... We are all driven by trying to be successful, make our parents proud or whatever. With with that, if one of the effects is, oh, we, we're taking up a lot of jobs, well, the onus is not on us to come back out of the fucking space that we've worked so fucking hard to get into. The onus is on other people to fucking create more space. Yeah. We are still the small minority in this fucking country and we're bitching over ourselves. So do, you, do someone's have an obligation to create some space? No. We don't. No one has an obligation to create space. I, I don't tr- feel I like you should. I try. How? <laughs> so even with Regan, oh. Regan as a as a new and creative, um, if I was an asshole, I could have very easily taken his project off him and just put it in my back pocket as a Samoan and gone ahead. But how I marketed him to the funders was he's new and took a loan. He needs a new voice, right. and I opened that channel for him. And that's that's mean. Um, but you don't have to. I don't have to. Yeah, right. So that's what I mean by obligation. But I don't. I, I don't feel like you have to. Yeah, I get you. I don't feel like you're obliged to, especially. I don't think that with Samoans are deliberately trying to dominate. Yeah, like yeah, yeah, There was yeah, a paragraph yeah. in there saying he knows Samoans are trying to dominate. Bullshit. Everyone, especially in this day and age of fucking high prices for everything. That's what I'm trying to get at. Yeah. Like we share. Like we're trying. Like we're we're, we're right. okay with you guys like, being alongside us. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Like, fuck. At the end of, end of the day, we we want the best for that job as mm. well. Like, because we'll probably benefit in other ways indirectly. But I don't think any Samoan is deliberately trying to take up more space. Yeah. Again, we are fucking less than 10% of the population. All Pacific peoples together, we are less than 10% of the population. And like, it's like, oh, we should be sharing that little space instead of fucking, why don't we create more space? Yeah. I feel that. Like, everybody drive. Well, okay, this is maybe a bit of a side step, but, like, creating more space, like, what does that look like? Exactly. Who knows? Fucking just go out and do stuff. Like, this is creating space. Mm -hmm. You know, for Samoan dudes, we just happen to be Samoan. Let's just fucking get a podcast going, right? This is creating our own space. The the example would be what I did with freaking was just opening that channel for him so he can go as doing his own thing. Now he is, he's writing his own projects, he's working on his own projects and I've alleviated kind of that va, that space for him to work off the funders directly rather than go through me because I've already got those contacts. I guess for us to get the leverage we have, for example, like your opportunity to open that up for Regan. Mm. Um, but well, I didn't have to. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know that you didn't have <laughs> yeah, to but yeah, where yeah. I'm going with this is that you know, if like Farani was saying, our relationship with the other Pacific minorities, so to speak, is you know, if we're looked at as a sibling, and you know, if that if that's the family dynamic, wouldn't you have an obligation to help your family? No, you know, in the Pacific, there were wars too. Fuck, we clashed, we fought, we saw seeing who's the best at this, best at that. That's all part of it. I mean, meritocracy. I'm not. I'm not saying just to give it because he's yeah because <sighs> he's you know him. But I like, just like, think... this, like you know, talent gets looked over because of lack of leverage, lack of opportunity. That's another thing you just brought up. Just because he's new, at, I didn't. He's talented. That's why the opportunity was there. Yeah, he deserved it. That's yeah, and that's it. Like yeah. your talent, your hard work, your skills. That all talk yeah i'm not saying that those who aren't in the spaces aren't skillful but like go do shit like all of us we we just gotta fucking keep pushing forward i feel like this is some fucking there fluff <laughs> there is something coming from the academic community uh, they're going after someone's it's fucking ridiculous 
I saw another piece where this girl was like, oh, do you remember? Um, oh, Samoan men, we've got to protect from our daughters and all of this. And like literally thousands of Samoan men are raising, are, are raising girls. Like if there's something wrong, we need to help the Samoan men because they're fathers and all of this shit. Like mm. there's so much going after Samoan men at the moment. And I feel like this is just another fucking theoretical think piece to try and fucking weaken Samoan Samoan men or Samoan people. Like, what's the point of this? My message to Samoan people is just keep fucking working hard, keep striving for your goals, keep trying to live your best life, keep going forward. Don't worry about anything else. Fuck, man. Keep doing shit. Just go and uh, sitting down and thinking of ways to try and take opportunity from Samoans who are in these places who have worked so hard to get there. That's a good point. I don't fucking, I don't see the point in this. Like, As long as no one gatekeep, that's what matters. That's the other problem. That's the, yeah. you know, as long as no one gatekeep. Yeah, that's the other problem. See, that's the thing, gatekeeping. So you'd naturally gatekeep because of those, you know, A, you know, if you want meritocracy, but that's all theoretical. Like, what's gatekeeping for um, a social worker to gatekeeping for uh, a, a someone lecturer and gatekeeping for a someone police officer or gatekeeping for a someone teacher? Like, mm. that's the thing about these theories. And that's why fucking academics, they sit and come up with theories and think it applies to everybody when everybody's living all these different, completely different lives when none of their theories actually apply to all of us. That's why fucking academics academics, because in the real world, it's different. That's why they invented it, intersectionality. That's why they invent <laughs> these fucking theories, because they have the time to sit there and dream of theories, because they're not in the fucking real world. We are dealing with people every fucking day. You're dealing with hardships and all this bullshit. Theoretical bullshit. Ain't no one trying to take anybody's space. We're trying to fucking make it. Fucking prices, mortgage, rent, shit. Yeah. So we should share. No, we need to, we need to push well, forward and for your family yeah, and yeah, whatever yeah. happens. Yeah, but what I mean to to share the space, right? Is also to share the knowledge, right? You, it depends. You have yeah, to yeah. think you economically as well. You, like, yeah, you can share the knowledge, but it's up to them to take it whether the whether it's worth for their value. Otherwise, they should. Knowledge is also. Um, economic as well. Intellectual property is a real thing. If you know you're going to make money from a great idea, you'll be foolish to share it. So it depends. What's sharing the knowledge in music to creative to rugby? Like, again, everything's so different. Yeah, None so. of these theories will apply to everybody. Yeah, I mean, you can, yeah, uh, understandably be as, you know, you can be inconsistent in, in all of these areas because, you know, like, like you were saying earlier, a very long time ago that, you know, the, you know, there's a place to be humble and then there's a place to show your ego. Um, ego being, you know, if you need to protect certain things to keep your economic advantage, you may certainly do so. Mm. Um, but then, you know, you bring up a, a point of sharing and, you know, this is a space where, you know, where, you know, the, the reality is we're sharing this with not only Islanders, but also other ethnicities and, and all of that. So space, space and space is always going to be you will it's, be the it's judge be fought over. in your own life. You will be the judge of what sharing is, what gate, gatekeeping is in your, mm. in your business in your um, business and your the business. Gatekeepers are my business to someone. Oh. <laughs> wow. I'm just saying it. That's, that's why I was opening those channels for other creators. And it wasn't a race thing. It was just fuck who was the best. Who was the best? Well, it's, it's not, it's not, an easy thing. That's the problem with this is that they come up with a theory they think mm. applies to everything yep, yep, and yep. it doesn't. And what it does is it gets people riled up. It ends up creating more division and more negative vibes or fucking Indians from different places in India and even Fijian Indians are uniting to take our whole community, putting vape stores next to alcohol stores that our kids are going to while we're theorizing like, oh, Samoans are taking up too much space. <laughs> Fuck! We've just <laughs> lost all of our businesses in our community. What about those spaces? Mm. Bullshit. We're not the problem. We've lost the, the spaces in our fucking businesses and all of our communities. The gas station's gone. The bakery's gone. Everything. 
uh, you got a problem with those spaces being taken up. Now it's the Samoans. Fuck. Uh, let's pivot. And speaking yeah. of one of our businesses, <laughs> rather than this silly article, um, Manhattan uh, on their social media page uh, has uh, made an announcement, end of era. Uh, if you're living outside of New Zealand or even if you visited for whatever, it could have been a wedding, a funeral or it's 21st uh, and you came to Auckland and you went to an event, uh, you would have come to Manhattan, which is a spot out on Dominion Road, out in uh, Mount Roscoe, uh, central Auckland. Um, and it's been a, 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 almost a safe space for a lot of Pacific people since the 70s. My mom was telling me about the space where they used to go and there used to be a nightclub back in the days. And all the islanders used to hang there and they had telephones and all that. And they would call people from the other table. Oh, and, yeah, yeah. They would call, that's, that's what my mom told me. Like They would call other people from tables and... Um, and then it evolved into a, a more family kind of orientated mm. space where live bands would play. Um, and then they had catering services. Uh, so it's a, you know, if, if you wanted Pacific soul food, this was the space. Um, and a lot of people, a lot of Samoan, Tongan, uh, New Wayans as well were invited to this space. Um, uh, have enjoyed have enjoyed being at this place. Um, and so on their social media page, they posted, end of an era, it's with a heavy heart that we share Manhattan catering services has officially come to an end. It's been an incredible ride with moments of joy, excitement, seemingly insurmountable odds and invaluable learning. Uh, to all the supported us, to all those that support us throughout the years, thank you. Your belief and trust in us has been the driving force. Uh, further down the paragraph, it goes into, we wish the new owners, Tui Samoa Catering, the very best. Uh, so I think it's going to exist even further, but um, Manhattan. Mm. You been us? Yeah, bro. <laughs> Central Auckland hotspot, that, that place, bro. What did you go for? Everything? Yeah, I think it, it could have been a, a function... Yeah, there was everything, eh? Birthdays, yeah. uh, funeral services, um, Masamo competitions. That's right. Yeah, they've had events yeah. there. Yeah. That's iconic, bro. The Manhattan is iconic for our generation. Yeah. Um, also, yeah. Re rest in love to Phil uh, Milesia, mm. who was uh, part of the family that ran um, the Manhattan from the 90s. I think he acquired it in the late 80s. He was a family friend. Um, so rest in peace to him. Uh, love to the family that have moved on from that. Have you guys, you guys, you've shot things there, eh? <laughs> you've yeah, filmed heaps, things there, eh? Heaps of things. Weddings. <laughs> I filmed funeral stuff True, there. Yes, 21st weddings. weddings. Yeah, um, yeah. Yeah. So many things. Mm. Yeah. We we need <laughs> we need these these vars. We need these spaces because they're you know it's 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 hard enough to organize venues for our families that cater to our family specifically. And this is like one of the perfect spaces. So hopefully with the new company moving in, they continue on the tradition. But uh, yeah, big shout out to Manhattan for being that spot for many, many years. Yeah, decades. Uh, that is us for episode, what is this, 33? 33. 33. <laughs> yeah. uh, big shout out to the team. Freemasonry. Hope you guys. Yeah, the highest degree in Freemasonry. Oh, 33 threes? Oy. Oh, no. I was actually, I filmed at a Freemason spot. Yeah. This. <laughs> yeah, you did, Danny. <laughs> I can tell. Now, no. no, this um before we wrap up, um out in Narawahia, there's a place called Nga Arts. And so I went there as a part of my job to go film the artists there. Um, but the place was barren, it was empty. Mm. And the big building, big scary white mm. building, and the, the Maori girl sat there was like, no one comes here because of the Freemason yes. stuff. And I was like, poor thing. There's a Freemasonry Lodge in Samoa. True. Yeah, it's, it's named the uh, Calliope. It's named after... So when the big hurricane hit and sunk six warships, there was mm. one boat, the British boat, went out. And the, the ones that stayed in the port all sunk, the German and the American, three German, three American, that ship was called the Calliope. It's a British one. Mm. And that's the Freemasonry Lodge in Samoa. You know who's the member? Pardon? You know who's the member? No, I don't. Meliakoa. Yeah, so. He's a member, but. Yeah. What is, what's the rules while we're on this topic? Rituals. Ah, yeah. Rituals. Puff Daddy, Puff Daddy parties. P Diddy parties. <laughs> you have to do adrenochrome and all of that stuff. 
Okay, we're going to wrap it up, guys. That is, I swear, it was 33.